just silencing my cell phone like the sign said, so. <laughs> hey, hey, good to have you back, Bill. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> We've been in a series of messages on how to break the bondage in our life, how to walk in freedom in our life, and uh, we're continuing that for the next several weeks, so uh, at any point you missed one, we do post them up on the web, uh, hopefully mostly every week, sometime a week or two late, but we get, we get them up. If you want it faster than that, you can always request one of those CDs or DVDs at the back, but uh, this series is an important message for all of us, no matter how old you are in the Lord, how long you've been saved, how mature you are, because these are things that we always need to be rehearsing and re refreshing in our minds because I don't know about you, uh, it's easy to forget. It's not just because I'm older than dirt. Somebody was saying today, but well, I just can't remember anything anymore. I said, it's not my problem. I, I said, I have a data storage problem. <laughs> I need to increase my storage capacity. I, I filled it all up. I mean, with all the things that I've got to experience in my life. So uh, I don't want to erase anything. I just need more storage. Amen. As we've talked about this, this issue of spiritual warfare and uh, spiritual troubles and things like that to come, I remember telling a guy uh, at one time after I hadn't been saved too long, I said, you know, I said, I never had all these problems before I met Christ. You ever had that? You ever felt that way? I never had to deal with this before I met Jesus. Never had all these issues going on in my life. But, and uh, people feel that way. You can be sure that part of that is because you were never a threat to Satan before, and you are now. If you ever discover what he doesn't want you to discover, you're going to break hell up, all right? You're going to be a threat every morning when you wake up. The devil's going to say, oh, no, he's up again kind of thing. But when, you, when we really discover who we are at Christ, because a lot of people have kind of a, a, a phobia in regard to talking about these issues on spiritual warfare and the devil and demons and stuff. And, uh, but let me say, you have no reason whatsoever to, to be afraid of it. Before you meet Christ, you don't realize it because the Bible says that we're, we're blind. You know, that the God of this world, that's a little g, hath blinded the mind of unbelievers, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Christ Jesus. Simply put means, you just don't know how good God is till you get saved. Amen. And you start receiving it and understanding it. But after that, when you come to Christ, there's no reason to have any fears in your life. Uh, I think a good illustration would be, it just tells us that demons and the devil, it's kind of like germs, you know. Uh, all around us, there's, there's germs. Uh, I mean, the person sitting beside you is covered with them. <laughs> but so are you, all right? Uh, and there's people, they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, weird about that and hypochondriac physically about it, germs and stuff. Uh, you know, that Howie Mandel guy, he's always just a comedian. He won't shake people's hands. He does a fist bump like there's not any germs on the back of your hand. I don't know what he's got to do. But anyway, it's because, you know, we have these phobias. But we're not afraid of germs, normal people, amen? <laughs> Nobody normal here but me. <laughs> we're not afraid of them, us normal people, <laughs> of germs. I mean, we, we not take care of ourselves, proper hygiene, wash your hands, you know, eat right, do all, get proper sleep, and you, you're not as subject to those kind of things. But there's no fear. It's the same way once we realize and take proper spiritual care of ourselves, we don't have to be afraid of the devil. We're not afraid of demons. You know, once we realize who we are in Christ and all that God has done for us, and it certainly changes our life when we realize uh, the, only, you know, the only thing about demons is their mouth. They are habitual liars. The Bible says even Satan is the father of lies. But in Christ Jesus, as we've been building this series each week, discovering our position, discovering who we are in Christ, we begin to realize that, uh, you know, we're, we're equipped to deal with, with everything the devil does because if his, uh, cheap, if his chief method is lying, then we have the answer. It's called truth. So we don't, you know, he'll try to lie to us. We just out-truth him, basically. And that's the heartbeat. In Ephesians 6, it talks about how we stand in that position. And it, many of you read this passage props uh, maybe hundreds of times, but then, and there's always something more to get out of it every time I read it. But we'll just call this in Ephesians chapter 6, we'll read from today, verses 10 through 18. Let's just title it the Christian Magna Carta of Protection. All right? Because it tells us here that we are in a spiritual battle and there is a war going on, but we don't have to be afraid of anything. In fact, he tells us, finally... 
Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood. So look at your wife, sir, and realize that she's not your struggle. Look at your husband. Go ahead, I know it may be hard. He's not your struggle. Look at anybody in this church that you may be having a conflict with. They're not your struggle. That's not your battle. Your battle is against flesh, not against flesh and blood, but it's against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, since we're in this spiritual battle, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming or fiery darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. So he tells us very quickly, our conflicts are not with each other. Our conflicts are in a spiritual realm. We need to be focused on who the enemy is. We need to understand that he's a defeated foe. We've talked about our position of authority the last couple of weeks in reality. And now he's saying, how do we stand in that authority that we know we have? Last week we said that we have the might and the right in Christ Jesus to be victorious. We talked about those two words and what they meant with might and right. God has given us this privilege of authority and he's given us the power to carry out that privilege of authority as well. And now he tells us what we need to do that. One thing you really catch from this passage is this. We are not passive in our relationship or in our Christian life. You cannot be passive. You can't say, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to pray. I don't. No, the Bible gives us a very clear indication that we have certain responsibilities if we're going to be victorious, right? You have to be strong. It talks about putting on and standing. It talks about taking up and, and being able, all right, which requires energy. It talks about resisting and, again, standing firm. And he talks about praying. So there's no place for passivity. You just can't say, ah, I'm not interested in that. If you take that position of passivity, then what you literally become is a prisoner of war. You find yourself in captivity and in bondage to all kinds of things. Now, some people might ask what well, seems to be a logical question. Well, Pastor, you told me last week that my position is secure. You've told me that my protection is in him. You've told me that the victory has been won. So why in the world do I need to put on all this stuff and take all this action? It's, it, it's the same logic, which is illogical at this point, of a soldier who says, you know, I live in America. I represent the American. I've taken a, a, a covenant, an oath to my country. We're the most advanced military power in the world. So why do I need to wear a helmet? Why do I need to wear any protection? Why do, why do I need to carry a rifle? Why do I need to learn how to shoot a rifle? And people approach their spiritual like that, like that, you know? That may all well be true, but if you want to secure that victory that has already been secured by Christ, then you're going to have to get ready for the battle. Because there is this process until Jesus comes of warring on this particular level. You're going to have to go to war. The great Jess Penn Lewis wrote that classic Christian, Nawa, Christian book on, called The War on the Saints. And he said this, The chief condition for the working of evil spirits in human beings apart from sin is passivity. In exact opposition to the condition which God requires from his children for his working in them. In other words, if you're going to be what God's called you to be, it's going to take action. There's going to be steps of faith. There's going to be commitments to the word of God. There's going to be obedience to the word of God. All this will be part of your life. And if you choose not to do that, then you can be sure Satan's going to take advantage of that and keep you in bondage and keep you in captivity. I have to take my stand daily. I have to believe God daily. I have to put on my armor daily. I pray daily. I want to walk in the victory that Christ has given to me as a gift. But it must be 
opened. It must be appropriated. It must be received. And that's, that's on a daily basis. So let, let's talk about this armor and what it means to, to be dressed for success, if you want to put it that way. In Ephesians 6, 14, he says this. He said, you know, you must put on the whole armor. Now, in a nutshell, the, one of the best sermon series I ever, messages I ever heard of this was by Mickey Bonner. When he talked about putting on the whole armor and he went through and dissected the armor piece by piece and showed us that's Jesus, that's Jesus, that's Jesus, and that's Jesus, and that's Jesus, all right? Which basically wraps it up in Romans 13, put on the Lord Jesus. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. If you want to know what it means to put on Christ, if you want to know what it means to get dressed in warfare, it literally means to submit to him as the Lord of your life. Submit to him as the Lord over your whole life. Not, not just in your words, but in your actions. Not just say he's Lord, but I'm really surrendering to his lordship. I'm letting God direct my life today. I'll go where he goes, say what he says, do what he says. You know, I'm going to do what Christ wants me to do. And how will I know what that is? He'll make it clear by his presence in my life. He'll make it clear through his word in my life. It's amazing how God, by means of the Holy Spirit, is able to lead the child of God to be what he's called us to be. So what's it mean, putting on him? Uh, just put yourself on the, the headship of Jesus Christ. All right? Now, 1 John 5, 18 says, We're of God, little children, and the wicked one cannot touch us. Now, the extent of that is carried out when I really put on Jesus. All right? Jesus said of the, went before his disciples, before his departure, he says, you know, he talked about that the, 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 the Satan's coming, and, but he'll find nothing in me. You know, when the wicked one comes, he'll find nothing in me. In other words, Satan loves to condemn and he loves to accuse. So when he comes to Jesus, he finds no grounds for condemnation there. He finds nothing to accuse. Why? Because Jesus is perfect, right? So he can't accuse Christ of anything. So what happens if I find myself in putting on Jesus when Satan comes with his accusations, he can't touch me. What if I fail to do so? What if I choose to walk in my strength today? Live the way I want to live today. Act the way I want to act today. Respond the way I want to respond today. I am an open subject and an open target for the enemy. That's why we're commanded, hey, don't make provision for the flesh. Why? That's Satan's territory. Put on Jesus Christ daily. So as you look at all this, it has to do with putting on Christ. Now, and, and there's, the way it's written is, is unique because in Ephesians 6, 14 and 15, he reveals three pieces of armor that you've already put on. And he uses this, this verb tense. He says, having put on, you know, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes. And he uses those three in the context of something that's been done in the past. It's a Greek word, a, a having, that signifies an action that's completed before you're commanded to take your stand out here. In other words, you've done this before you take your stand. Of course, it's the logical way which you get ready for battle. You put on your, your belt, which is your weapons, and, and you put on, you know, your shoes so you can be able to stand first. And you put on your protective breastplate. This, this, this all happens, I think, we're introduced to these elements of this armor when we come to the Lord Jesus Christ. When we receive Christ, we receive what we need. And he breaks it down from that point to having put on the belt of truth, all right? By the way, Jesus is the truth. As we get back to each piece represents him. Because Christ is in me, because Jesus lives in you, I, I have what I need. Satan's primary weapon is always, we said week after week, is the lie. He comes with a lie. And if you listen to his lies, then you don't stand firm. If you listen to his, his, his storyline and his condemnation and his accusation, you're going to fall every time. You are an easy target. But you stand firm by standing in the truth so that everything that comes against me is, is measured and weighed out and filtered through truth. You're sorry. In Christ, I'm not. You've sinned. In Christ, I'm righteous. You're worthless. In Christ, I'm profoundly rich. <laughs> in, in other words, uh, uh, I, go, I go fishing with Alan, and he has a, 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 a measurement on the side of his boat for, the, for fish, all right? And in, in Texas, we have what we call slot limits on a lot of our fish because we're trying to protect the species, all right? And so they can birth more fish. So they, they don't want you taking fish that are, are at the prime stages, you know, of either development or giving birth to other fish. So like with redfish, what's the slot limit for a redfish, Alan? 20 to 28, all right? 
You know, it's hard to throw back a 19 inch fish. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> it's hard to throw back a 19. It's hard to throw back a 19 and a three quarter inch fish. <laughs> There's a slot. And so if you're going to keep the fish, you're going to get back to the pier. And a lot of times the game warden's up there checking people out. You know, right, Frank? Yeah. Okay, Frank, no. <laughs> <laughs> to see if you kept the limit. And so all the fish you catch, you gotta filter through that standard. Every day you're in the spiritual arena and Satan is coming at you with all kinds of things in your mind, subjecting you to all kinds of temptations, accusations, condemnations. You have to filter everything through the standard of the word of God. Jesus in the wilderness three times in temptation, what happened? He would come to him and say, if you are, by the way, Jesus knew who he was, it's interesting to see Satan's always attacking us in our identity, who we are. We know we're complete. We're the children of God in Christ, right? So we talked about two weeks ago knowing who you are. If you are, and every response Jesus gives is filtered through, he just gives the truth back. It is written. It's written. So whether it's temptation, whether it's accusation, whether it's condemnation, then we, at that point, hey, it's, it's, it holds it all together. It's the truth of God's word. Keep a clear heart, keep a clear mind, keep a clear conscience. You know, embrace truth, reject lies. You know, really kind of adopt this rule of behavior. If, the, if it's truth, count me in. If it's the truth, count me in. And if it's not, count me out. Here's the thing as Christians. When, you, when, when I came to Jesus Christ, I had a lot of junk in the trunk, right? A lot of garbage in my life. But I laid it all out. I, in fact, one of the most hum, humiliating, humbling experiences is when God shows you all that stuff you don't even want to see. And you get a good look at all the trash. But when you come to Christ and you lay all that out there and he puts the paid for, the precious blood of Jesus is applied to it and you're forgiven, there's such liberty. You know, it's like you can breathe for the first time. When you, when you really get a grip on that, it's just life comes in. Now, if I walk in Jesus and walk in that truth, then I can experience that on a regular basis. Jesus prayed for his disciples in John 17. I'm not asking you, Lord Father, to take them out of the world just to keep them from the evil one. And we, we find that provision for us in Christ Jesus. But it's based upon the truth because the way Satan will dialogue with us is always through his lies. And we hold those lies up when they come to the light of truth. When Satan says, look at all that you've done, I say, it is written. If we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, therefore, I'm cleansed, I'm made right. Or I can walk around and say, oh, I'm just not much of a Christian. I want to be better. Then there's the breastplate of righteousness after the belt of truth. With the breastplate of righteousness, when you, when you put on Christ in salvation, when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, you know, you were made righteous in him. You, you were justified. The Holy Spirit comes in and clothes you in the, in the righteousness of God. It's a gift from God. First Corinthians talks about this. Philippians 3 talks about a righteousness which doesn't come by good works or the law. It comes by faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you, when you, before you meet Christ, we're under judgment. Jesus said, he that believeth not is condemned already, right? So if I don't know Christ, man, the big sum of judgment is on my head. If I die at any moment, I'm gonna die and I'm gonna go to hell because I am a sinner. I've rejected God's authority in my life. I've chosen to do what I wanna do. In reality, I'm just submitting to the, the, the course and the, of action the devil wants for my life, but judgment rests on me. Beautiful thing is that Jesus paid so that that judgment doesn't have to rest on me. And if I come to him, guess what? Judgment is taken off. The sentence of death has been removed. The sentence of judgment, the, the, the sentence of hell, eternity in hell has been removed. I've been made free in Christ Jesus. I, 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 why, what happens now? Then God in, gives me what was my problem was self-righteousness, ungodliness, living for myself, and Jesus now gives me this gift according to Romans chapter five of righteousness, the gift of righteousness. Not merited, not earned, not deserved. You know, I can't go walk around here and say, well, I preach and I've done this and I've taught Sunday school and I've read the Bible and I know Bible verses and I've memorized scripture and I pray, therefore, I'm righteous. No, it's not a righteousness based on ritual. It's a righteousness based upon my relationship with Jesus Christ. 
And in Romans 8, some of y'all been reading Romans 6, 7, 8 this last couple weeks. In Romans 8, it says, who's going to bring charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. And so if you're a Christian, you've been justified. And with that is this great gift of righteousness or this legal judgment against you because you're guilty has been removed. So we rejoice now that we have this, this position of righteousness and standing firm in that righteousness has to do with me staying right with the Lord in my own personal walk. There's that positional righteousness. I've been made right with God. But now there's practical righteousness. If I do fail, if I do sin, if I do rebel against God, as a child of God, all that's been paid for. But if I want to experience God's freedom in my life, I'm going to have to believe the truth of what I said a while ago, 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And listen to this, you know this verse, and to do what? Cleanse us from unrighteousness. So for me to put on the breastplate of righteousness, I already have it as a gift, but for me to experience it in my life practically in warfare, I need to make sure my heart's clean. I need to get rid of the junk. I need to get rid of the sin. I need to confess the pride. I need to lay down the ego. I need to lay down the arrogance. Whatever it might, and however it might manifest itself, I'm going to, to stand in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to confess? We, we've talked about it many times. It means to agree with. It's the word in Greek language, logos. Part of it is for word, and it's homologos. And it means to say the same thing. So he said, in scripture, you could even translate it. If we say the same thing that God says about our sin, then we can be cleansed. What's God say about it? Well, it's wrong. Okay, I got that down. It's wrong. I know that. And it's also, it needs to be forsaken, so I forsake it. It has to do with repentance and faith. I believe it, and I receive it by turning from it and turning to Christ. But if I'm going to embrace this thing, if I just say, well, I've got sin in my life, I know, I've got sin in my life, and just admit it, that's not confession. There's a lot of people who admit they've sinned, all right, but they haven't confessed it, all right? And they may even feel sorry for it, but that's not confession either. You, you haven't said the same thing that God says about it yet. You haven't agreed with God about your sin. So what do I need to do? It's like here, if, a, if you go out of the church and you have a, a little boy with you and, and your son picks up a rock and chunks it at a car and breaks a window, you know, uh, after you've just about lost your mind, you're going to take your son and you're going to deal with him about, you know, if the little boy said, you, you said, son, you threw that rock and we don't throw rocks at cars. And the boy just says, yeah, I'm sorry, dad. He hadn't confessed yet. That, that, that doesn't cut it yet. But, and he may say, oh, please forgive me, dad. He still hadn't confessed. He will confess when he agrees with his dad. I threw at that, a rock at that car. For whatever reason I did it, I did it. And I was wrong when I did it. And I'll do what you want me to do, Dad. Then he's confessed. I'll make this right. You confess your sin. Basically, you're saying to God what he says about your sin. Now, Satan comes. It's the way he likes to write. Oh, that was too big a sin. Or it's too late. Or you've done that before. And he likes to say, God's just going to race your name right out of the book of life. You're going to hell. But you have to realize you're not, you don't have your righteousness based on your merit. Again, it's based upon the grace of God. My daily victory is in keeping my heart right with God and keeping the things that, are, that I've failed God in and the sin against God in right and confessed up and under the blood of Jesus. Remember I said as Christians, we're not sinless, but we do sin less. But when we do sin, we confess our sin to God. Paul said in Acts chapter 24, I always do my best to maintain a clear and a blameless conscience before God and before men. I want to have a blameless conscience before God and before men. That people can't point something out at me and say, well, look at that, that's what God's saying. Because that's Satan's job already, amen? So the breastplate of righteousness, I put that on when I got Jesus, but I keep putting it on daily by confessing my sin. And he talks about having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Well, you got that when you got saved, why? Because Jesus is the prince of peace, all right? Now, Satan's favorite method, especially in church, is division, Amen. He always works to get people divided, family against family, brother against brother, sister against sister, people against people, group against group. He's always working to bring some kind of division. That's why the Bible says we labor, we work to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace because we don't want to give Satan an opportunity. So what happens? We have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. First and foremost, that means Jesus has brought peace into my life, the Prince of Peace, who I had no peace with God, because I was alienated from God by my sin. And I, I was an enmity, the Bible says, all right, with God. 
I was resisting God and God's resisting me. But when I come to Christ, I experience the peace of God. Romans 5 talks about by faith or say we experience by faith the peace of God. We have peace with God. So I have a peaceful relationship with God. But it goes on to say, not only have I made this new relationship, Paul put it this way, I've been reconciled to God by Son Christ Jesus. Now I have peace with God. And, but now he's given me a ministry of reconciliation. So part of my makeup in life is not just to receive the peace of God, to be a deliverer of the peace of God. Whether I'm reaching people with the gospel of peace, sharing Christ with them, or resolving conflicts within our fellowship and within the body of Christ and between brothers and sisters in Christ. That's my, whole, that's my ministry. That's your ministry. It's all our ministry. To always be reconciling, to always be bringing parties together. Boy, this is Jesus' prayer in John 17. If we ever get this, it's going to shut down hell. Unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Father, I'm praying, don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one and make them one. Make them one. And the world will see when they're one. Now, this is where Satan loves to come again. He likes to put in seeds of division and seeds of strife. And there's conflicts come. Uh, conflicts always come in life. I mean, you're not going to get them in rhythm of your marriage. You're not going to get rid of them in your church. You're not going to get rid of them in your, your small group. You're not going to get rid of them at the office. Conflicts always come. It happens. In fact, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, conflict comes to show you who the real leaders are. Leaders do what? They reconcile. Leaders restore. He said, but conflict comes because, you know, well, James put it this way, where does all this division come? You want something and you don't get it. And they want something and it's, you don't want to give it. I mean, every marriage conflict usually just boils down to who's going to get whose way. Some of you told me before, the resolution to every conflict in my home is, yes, dear. <laughs> you, give, you give in. That's not the way to resolve situations. That God has answers. God wants to bring the unity of the mind, preserve the unity of the spirit. And we do that by taking initiative as the children of God as peacemakers. Uh, a lot of times when I'm, I'm praying with people, and I'll share a scripture with them, or sometimes I'll be an email, so it might be a text that somebody's really going through a difficult battle. One of the verses that really sprung out and God spoke to my heart is in Romans 16, 20, that one there at the end. It says, and the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. Isn't that a great verse? And the God of peace, we're the peacemakers, by the way. Bless the peace. And the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet. Why? Because he's already under the feet of Jesus. Prophetically fulfilled at the cross in Genesis, amen? In Genesis where he said, and he's going to, you know, he'll bruise your heel, but you're going to crush the serpent's head. You want to know where Satan's head is? Under the feet of Jesus. Guess what? I'm wearing his shoes. <laughs> I got my gospel shoes on, then he's under ours. And, and we need to make that always our goal. We're always remembering who the enemies are and who, who we are in Christ and that Satan is a defeated enemy. So the rest of the wardrobe goes down like this. The other three mentions he, uh, pieces that he mentions are, are the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation. And, and the sword of the Spirit. The first three are established primarily by our relationship now that we have with Christ Jesus, all right? We have peace with God. We have the righteousness of God. We have the truth now in Jesus Christ. The next three help us now to, to stand firm, to, to continue to win this battle, all right? It, 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 first of all, he starts out with the shield of faith there. Now, contrary to popular misconception, faith is not some kind of force, it's not some kind of mystical feeling. It's not some kind of something you, you have to muster up, you know. You know, say, so you just need more faith, or you just need to, you just have to apply more faith. And we're, you know, no. Faith, let me give you a simple definition for faith. Biblical faith is what you believe about God, His Word, and obey. All right? Obey being the key word. Faith without works is not really faith. It's just dead, right? It's just some kind of empty beliefism. So if I really do believe that I'm a sinner, Jesus died for my sins, guess what I'm going to do? If I really believe it, not just a man, I, I'm going to follow Jesus. You take up the cross, deny yourself, follow Christ. That's faith. And at that moment, I choose to believe on that level. Guess what? Everything God's done for me becomes reality in my life. I'm this new person of Christ. I've been redeemed. I'm changed. I'm under the blood of Jesus Christ. But biblical faith is not just saying, well, I agree to some facts and I assent to that information. No, it's saying I, I, I trust it at the point I'm following it. And you heard me when I preached on faith before. I said, my simplest definition is really just faith is following Jesus. What he says, where he leads, what he wants. Don't say you're following Jesus if you're not going where he says, not doing what he wants. Amen. 
If I, if, if, that's, if I just ignore that, then I really don't have faith. I just have religion based on ritual. But the shield of faith is, 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 the, is if I'm going to lift up the shield of faith in spiritual battle, then it means I need to become more intimately acquainted with Christ daily. I, I need to, to grow in grace. I need to grow in the knowledge of Christ. I need to know more about God. Now, I want you to know, folks, I'll, I'll be as honest as I can, all right? Now, that's me. That's pretty much all the time. Kathy tells me sometimes I'm too honest from the pulpit. But <laughs> Honestly, I know a lot about God. A lot. I know some of you think, you probably know more than I do. But you're paid to do that. <laughs> I know a lot about God. But I know, don't know God as much as I want to. And there's a big difference in there. We can know a lot about the president. We can know a lot about the governor. We can know a lot about politics. We can know a lot about so-and-so, but do we know? I want to know God more. I want to know God more intimately. And I believe the shield of faith has a lot to do with this. The more intimately I know God, I believe the greater the shield is. The greater the protection is. There's a lot of people running out in the battle who don't take time to know God. They, they won't take time to be in His Word. They won't take time to spend. I mean, there's elements to knowing someone. It's called time. It takes time. All right? A lot of time. It takes communication. It takes talk. All right? Those are all involved. And so if, if I'm living a Christian life and that element in part of my life, guess what? M my, my shield's about that big. And I'm going out against the devil with my little shield. But the more intimately I'm obedient and following and loving and committed and knowing, I believe the shield even gets bigger and, more, and stronger at that point. You know, and the... the I can respond to whatever Satan may be throwing my way. You want the shield of faith to grow larger than your knowledge of God, your knowledge of his word is going to have to grow larger as well. And that's true for every one of us, me included. Nobody's exempt from that. Amen? What are the flaming arrows? I mean, what are these flaming arrows that Satan continues to, to throw at us? They're nothing more than lies. His method is lies, condemnations, you know, anything that he can, can, can shove at you, accusations to bombard your mind with. And the only way you meet that is with your commitment in Jesus Christ, the Word of God. I, I'm committed to the Word, and I'm committed to Him, and I'm standing on these promises in faith. And that, that, that puts the, the darts out. And they'll come in. Sometimes, like a flood, they come in. But in, in all a part of that is also, I want you to take up the, the helmet of salvation. Uh, in case your shield's a little bit leaky, <laughs> a little bit small still, and perhaps your victory seems to be a little elusive, you can be confident of this one thing right here. You're wearing the helmet of salvation. Now, this is where, this is where you know, Satan's, you know, works. This is where we need our most protection, right? If, if the battle, battleground is the mind, then that's where we need the most coverage at. Now, I'm going to bring up something controversial because I like controversy. No. <laughs> this is a doctrine which a lot of people wrestle with. It's called the doctrine of the security of the believer. All right? For me not to believe that truth, as the Scripture says, would be like me not to put on my helmet. I know that even if I do sin against God, and I will, all right, and I do, and so do you, that I will not lose my standing with Him. All right? If I fail, the, the war is won, but if I lose this battle, it's going to be okay. I have, a, I, have a, I have a high priest I can go to. I, I have a mediator I can go to. I have a lawyer who stands at the judgment seat before God who will who'll straighten it all out for me. All right? I'm secure. Nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Nothing. Nothing. You say, well, does that include me? Hey, I'll leave that for you to figure out. But I think nothing kind of covers all of us. I mean, you can strain a gnat and swallow a camel, but nothing. You say, well, what if I sin? Now, let me get back to this. On this security issue, I believe once saved, always saved. But let's, let's emphasize the first part, once saved. There's a lot of people who've never been saved. There's a lot of people religious. They're Baptists, they're Methodists, they're Catholics. They go over and they've never, been, never given their life to Jesus Christ. All right? It's just never happened. They may be decent, moral, honest, good, reliable, you know, uh, good friends, good people, good guys, good woman, good dad, good mom, spy for the kids, whatever, but they've never come to faith in Christ Jesus. They're still trusting their ability, their righteousness. They still think they're going to stand before God and God's going to say, oh man, you've done better than you did bad, so come on in. You'll be okay. The Bible doesn't teach that, does it? Saved by grace through faith. 
And the grace of God is, is inclusive. So I know that even if I struggle in a battle, I've got a confirmation from God. I have, this, I have this helmet on that secures my position in Jesus Christ that I know him. And salvation is my eternal possession. One of the first messages we dealt with in this series was who you are. We said you are eternally alive and well. When does that begin? When you die? No, it begins when you get saved. When you give your life to Christ, you're eternally alive and well. Now, eternally, last time I looked in the dictionary, meant eternally. Now, if God is the God of the covenant, then it's secure. No matter what happens to me. I may fail God. I may fail miserably in my spiritual life. I will have to face God for those failures. The Bible talks about the bema seat. I'll have to be chastened in this life because of those failures. I'm going to have to pay a price because you reap what you sow. But I want you to know, this Christian warrior helmet that I wear, this, this helmet of salvation is that I know I am a receiver of the grace of God, a possessor of his deliverance. I am clothed in the victory of my headship as Jesus Christ, and it's him I'm wearing over me. Satan's the ruler of this world. Jesus is the ruler of everything. And his authority overrules every authority. And the Bible says that Christ has delivered us from the domain of darkness and translated us to the kingdom of his beloved sign. And he doesn't let me move. I've been moved from one kingdom to another. That's my new residence for all eternity. For all eternity. I'm part of this new, this new citizenship, this new world, and this new residency. The helmet of salvation. And I think that if you can get that, Satan won't be able to convince you, well, I guess you're just lost. I guess you're just going to hell. I guess you just blew it. No. If it was based on my, my, my righteousness, it would be that way. And then the sword of the Spirit, the only offensive weapon mentioned. And by the way, when you look at the Scriptures and you study this particular word, it's not the word logos, which is used so many times for the Word of God. You know, the Bible talks about in the beginning was the Word, it's logos, and we know that Jesus is the living, eternal Word of God. But it uses a word rhema, all right? And rhema has to do with something, as far as the word's concerned, about what has been revealed to you, what you understand, what's clear to you, all right? It's revelation, what you want to say. It's something God has revealed to you. And he says, you know, you take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the rhema word of God. Now, one thing about rhema is it's a declared word. It's something that God has spoken even to your heart or your spirit, but it, it has about it the connotation that you have to declare it. You need to agree with it. You need to, to speak it. When Jesus dealt with the enemy in the wilderness three times, he spoke out loud. Satan. When he, Satan tried to speak through Peter, Jesus said, Satan, get thee behind me. And there are times in spiritual battle in your life, you're going to have to address the enemy, and you're going to have to speak out what God has said. You're going to have to speak the truth of the word of God, that which God has spoken to your heart. Many, many times we are faced with issues in our life. Some of you have been saved for a while can relate to this. Maybe even saved for a short time. You can relate to this. Something happens and there's maybe an accusation, a, a temptation or whatever it might be. Uh, and all of a sudden something else happens. God speaks to your heart. The word comes. It comes. That's rhema. That's something God's revealing. Now you need to speak it. You need to agree with God. Hold fast that confession. Stand up. Say, uh, why? Because... Although God is omniscient, he knows everything. He knows every thought coursing through your mind, all right? He sees a, the devil's not omniscient. Now, every cult and everything that comes down the pike and every falsehood always claim know the future, know your thoughts. But no, only God knows the secrets and the intents of the heart. Amen? That's why you better be careful about judging people. God knows their intents. We say, well, I just think they're motivated by You don't know. You don't know. So the Bible said, don't be judging somebody else's servant. <laughs> he answers to his master. So we have to be careful. But obviously the devil loves this technique of saying stuff to us that's just not true. It's not the word of God. So what do we do? We take the word of God and we hold it up. Just like Jesus did in the wilderness, we speak that word of God. We claim that word of God. Now that's good to me to know because that means that Satan doesn't know what's going on in here. And he doesn't, if I'm praying in the sanctuary, the private part of my heart and life, and it's me and God in communion, he doesn't hear any of that. Only God hears that. That's why, that's why, you know, I like to pray a lot at night. You know, some of you are those kind of people that put your head in the bed, you know, you're out like a light. You know, 
And some of you are like me, you know, you just can't do that. You've got to solve all the world's problems before you go to bed, right? <laughs> Tell me, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You, you, that's the best time for prayer, you know? Those times are good for just taking some time, talk to the Lord, you know? And Kathy's really glad that I don't have to pray out loud. <laughs> In fact, she told me I woke her up a couple nights ago because I, somehow I thought I was praying quietly. But the God, you know, but at the same time that he can't see those things... When you're resisting him, he doesn't see that. He doesn't hear that. When you're saying, I'm not going to do that. And you're just in the heart of your mind, I'm not going to. You need to speak it out. You're in a war. And you need to tell the enemy what God's told you. So that when the accusation comes, the lie comes, the temptation comes, you say, you know, it is written. Man should not live by bread alone. I don't have to follow that desire. I didn't live by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I think I'll choose to believe what God says today. And let God, and that's where you become more familiar with the Word and memorizations. We've talked about the Word and meditating on the Word. You know, that you could, you know, that you can speak those things out. But that's what it means, I believe, to draw your sword when Satan comes in. Here's what God says. You know, here's what the Lord says. And the last part of all this, it wraps it all up about this context of why we put on the armor, and he talks about prayer, you know. And he talks about this protection of, of the power of prayer. And go back to that one slide with you right quick, because uh, it didn't all come up. But uh, prayer first, just simply put, it's talking with God. Through the avenue God's given you, talking to God through Jesus, where you're expressing, first and foremost, he's God, you're not, you're dependent on him, you can't make it without him, your life revolves around him, you need his strength, you need his power, you need his grace. It's with God that I'm saying, take on the armor today, God, I'm putting on Jesus today. All right, so that's the first aspect of, of standing firm. Now you can go to that next slide for me, would you, Jordan? The next slide says, it's with all prayer and petition that we pray at all times in the spirit, and with this in view, be on the alert. And while we're praying, he says, you need to be on the in a war with perseverance and petition for the saints. Now, those two words are great words when it talks about praying for other people. Perseverance and petition. Because we're praying for them, but sometimes it takes perseverance. And we continue to pray for them. We don't give up on folks. We keep praying for them. We keep believing God for them. We keep claiming the word of God. We keep renouncing the, the enemy's work. Uh, this, is, this is a battle, uh, it's a daily battle. For you that are parents, you should be well familiar with this battle. You, you got kids in rebellion against God, you're daily saying, Satan, you get your hands off them. You don't have authority over them today. You can't blind them today. You, you can't bind them today. Those are the two methods the scripture talks about. Satan blinds and binds, all right? And so we're constantly peeling off his little dirty claws off people's hearts and lives. So with this praying, first of all, there's this prayer, first, most specifically, I think, of the target of prayer. So we're praying for people that are unbelievers, all right? Praying for people, why? Satan's blinded the mind of unbelievers is what that scripture says. So I'm praying God open their eyes. They don't know you. They don't know how ignorant they are. They don't know how lost they are. They don't know they're going to hell. They don't realize all they're doing to themselves. I mean, people just kill themselves without even realizing it these days, I mean. They just, just like blind sheep, you know, following the, the, the blind sheep, just kind of going along. It's just, it's madness. But most people don't see that. And, and, and I'll refer to this one more time. I've talked about this in the past. When Phil would come over to my house, my brother, and talk to me about Jesus, you know, I just, you know, I'd laugh, make Jesus jokes, whatever I could. It's just, you know, it's foolishness. It makes sense to me. But the more that people prayed for me and the blinders came off, I began to see everything he was saying was true. I messed up. And I can't do anything about it. I've tried to do better, and it's not working. You know? And, and then he hit me with that one time we walked out of the house and said, Hey, if everything I'm saying to you is a lie, you ain't got anything to worry about. But if I'm telling you the truth, you're in trouble. And some of you are in trouble because you won't believe the truth. You need to get your eyes open. And people have been praying for you to get your eyes open. The second part of that is praying even for the saints. How much time do we spend praying for each other? Oh, God, open their eyes. Let them see the truth. Let them see light. Let them see, you know, bless them in such a way that as Paul's prayer in Ephesians 1, that the eyes of their understanding might be open, that they can see all you have for them. Because we got some backslidden saints. And most of them are blind at this point because they don't even know they're backslidden. Well, I'm not really in church, not reading my Bible. You got a fellowship with God. God, open their eyes of understanding. Let them see the truth. Let them discover what you have for them and, you know, do a supernatural work. And then he talks about in Scripture where Jesus said in Matthew, you've got to bind the strong man. This is where we speak against him. Satan, you don't have any authority in my home. I bind you, rebuke you in Jesus' name. You don't have any, you don't have any authority. And where, wherever I am is where God's given me to be. And wherever God's given me to be, that means he and I are in charge. <laughs> We're in charge. So we don't have to take a lot of stuff we take. Amen?
So I, I'm mad as heaven and ain't taking it anymore. <laughs> Some of you will get that in a minute. <laughs> I'm not taking it anymore. All far too often we just take it. Satan just dumps stuff on, we just take it. No, Jesus here, I'm here, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Get off my turf. You don't have any, you don't have any right here. If I've opened the door, God, show me so I can get that right and believe you. But if I'm in my armor and I'm in Christ and I need to take authority over the enemy and rebuke and bind the strong man, and you have every right as a child of God. And if you don't, as we read that quote from Jess Penn Lewis earlier, then you can live in captivity and be miserable. And you can let Satan manipulate your affairs and let him use you and defeat you and destroy all that God has for you when God wants to do so much more and something, something so much deeper and so much more real than what you've experienced prior. Get it, get it lined out with him, get it right with him and put him on in the day and then once you've got Jesus on, realize your biggest battle is in prayer. You know, at our church, whenever we have an evangelistic event, you know, a, a strategic evangelistic event, how we put the prayer wall out? Why do we do that? And we all have our names of the people we're praying. You know, under the carpet here, you may not know it, and all over this stage before we carpeted it and after the flood even came, there's names of people written in magic marker all over this, this altar underneath this carpet. Some of you are here for that, right? And it, 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 we just put on names just people we're praying for and then names upon that prayer wall. Sometimes you take those names and list and pray for them. We do that because that's where the real battle in evangelism even takes place. That's where the real battle in revival takes place. That's where the real battle in our life takes place. And far too often we, we think, no, I just got to have a better plan. <laughs> How's that working? <laughs> I always want to ask myself. If I ask that twice, it's because I'm always asking myself that. How's that working? And that pulling, I'm not working very well. The plan is Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's stay close. Let's stay clean. Let's stay, have a clear conscience before the Lord and before each other and see what God does in our lives. And then we stand in prayer, see the glory of God loosed. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me as we pray?